Larry Rosenthal is a registered representative offering securities and advisory services through Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, a broker, dealer, and registered investment advisor. Member FEMA SIPC. Satera is under its separate ownership for Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. Rosenthal Wealth Management Group is located at 9265 Corporate Circle in Manassas, Virginia, and can be reached at 703-330-3100. Chris McKay is not affiliated with Satera Advisor Networks, LLC, nor at Rosenthal Wealth Management Group. Bob Jones is a marketing assistant of Rosenthal Wealth Management Group and is associated with Satera Advisor Networks, LLC. It's time now for Making Money Sense with Larry Rosenthal. Larry is recognized as one of the nation's leading financial and retirement planners and is here right now to answer your questions. Author, speaker, and talk show host, Larry Rosenthal, is dedicated to teaching others financial stewardship from a biblical point of view. Call Larry now. Studio lines are open at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. Making Money Sense is on the air. How about that? We are on the air with Larry Rosenthal. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Chris. How are you this weekend? I'm doing well. The snow globe clock is really working, I noticed. What's the deal I with like that? I like it. I like it. Lots of snow out there in the, in the mid-Atlantic states and Don't across you? the country for that Everywhere. matter, too. Except for down fun. there in Florida where those it's guys fun. are just kind of yep. chilling. Yep. There you go. It yeah. should happen, right? <laughs> exactly. People skiing, having fun, snowmen. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a big change in the markets that happened just yesterday at the close of the market. We'll get into that a little bit here. Got some interesting news and some questions. Lots of questions now as a result of where the market ended up yesterday. But I have to say this. Congratulations to those of you who stayed and played. Stayed those of you who have played. stayed and played oh. in the market are now sitting at an all-time new high in the S&P 500. You know, last year when everybody was talking doom and gloom and all this kind of stuff, punt, chicken little in 2023, <laughs> I was in the camp of saying, no, I don't see that, okay? And I kept telling falling. people on this show numerous times that in 2024, I would not be surprised if we hit an all-time high. Now, it came a lot earlier than I thought it would, but it's there. Whether or not it stays, that's another question, right? That's a different question. But at the same time here, what happened? How did we get there? Okay. Friday, the benchmark, the S&P 500, which, by the way, Chris, the mm-hmm. Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P, okay, the, the S&P is a greater measurement of the st- overall stock market. The Dow has 30 stocks in it. The NASDAQ is just tech. But the S&P is more diverse across the 11 sectors of the economy, and it houses 500 stocks as representation. So it gives a wider breadth, a bigger indication of the overall market. Now, some are going to say, wait a minute, Larry, it's the Magnificent Seven, those handful of tech stocks that have been propelling it. Yes, that's true. But nonetheless, it's still there. The market closed yesterday at 48.39, which was above its previous high set on January 3rd, 2022 of (laughs) 47.96. What does this mean? What does this mean? Where are we? So the market has been in a bull market ever since the lows of October of 2022. That's when this thing reversed and started coming back up, okay? So what causes, what has to happen when the market hits bottom? This is the lesson. This is what we want to talk about today. What has to happen for the market to hit bottom? We have to run out of something. We have to run out of sellers. When everybody stops selling, the market has hit its bottom. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, when you really sit back and take a look at it. What has to happen for the market to go back up? Just because we get good economic information doesn't mean the market goes up. What has to go, what has to happen is money has to come back in and people have to start buying again. Okay? So there are still people right now today, unfortunately, that are still sitting on the sideline or still having a tremendous amount of defense in their portfolio, and they've missed this rebound that has happened, Mm. all right? So the question lies, now what? Why are we here? How did we get here to begin with, okay? Let's just start 
post-COVID. We'll start in 2022. The Fed starts, you know, we, we start to see the markets wobble. We start to see them come down in fears of all this inflation. The markets are getting, the, the uh, uh, Fed is raising rates in 2022, pushing the markets down, slowing the economy down. And then all of a sudden in October of 2022, we start to see a reversal in the market because all of a sudden, it looks like inflation is starting to crumble on the edges. It's starting to come down from its highs of 9.1%. Right now it sits at 34 by the way. Okay. And so now we've seen the economy turn. We've seen inflation start to come down. And we've seen the Fed raise rates 10 times over 14 months. And in month 17, we get the pause. And we're in that second stage now. The first stage was the Fed raising rates. Then the Fed pauses. Question is still unanswered. How long do they remain on the pause button? Maybe another three, four, five months. More economic data coming in. Is inflation going to turn to start to go back up again? The Fed's going to come in and raise again. If the, economic, if the inflation continues to cascade downward, the Fed could, if the economy slows enough, start to lower and in the first you know the end of last year the end of 2023 people were starting to get ahead of themselves saying oh look you know this this is good looking good the fed's going to start to lower right away in 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 24 and i was going no they're not it's going to take you know probably till springtime or so think think memorial day weekend to july 4th somewhere in there that's probably if then the Fed may, may start to lower just a little bit. But it's all going to depend over the next three or four months as to what inflation does and the strength of the economy, which is showing re lots of resiliency. So, so things look very good. But this all comes down to this question right now. With this market surging ahead, okay, you know, 25% off you know, fr from its peak, uh, when, when it slumped, down 25, now it's back, all-time highs again. Here's the big question. We have the stock market, meaning the S&P 500, at an all-time high, and we have bonds at a 16-year high yield. So you have bonds at its peak yielding right now, and the, and the S&P 500 at an all-time high. What do you do? What happens if you wanted to put new money to work? What about people that are saying, you know what, maybe I missed a little bit of this. Maybe we're going to get a little bit of FOMO, fear of missing out. How do I employ new dollars into a balanced, diversified, tax-efficient portfolio today to accomplish your goals, keeping an eye on risk, right, um, with bond yields at a 16-year peak and stock market at an all-time high? How do we do this? What do we do? First thing you have to do is really sit down and measure where you are and what you're trying to accomplish. What type of new dollars do you want to implement? Now, I'm not talking about taking money from one position like an old retirement plan and rolling it to an IRA. That's not what I'm talking about because that money's still in the market where it was and it'll still remain in a new place. My point is money in the bank. Or if you want to move money out of bonds into the market now, how do you go about doing this? What sectors do you want to stay in? So. We have to sort of break this down. We all have heard the, 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 the theme before of dollar cost averaging, which is put the same amount of money into the same investment at every interval, monthly, weekly, quarterly, whatever it may be. And over the long term, <clears throat> you'll end up with the average price of shares, okay? But we have to sit back and we have to say, well, what's propelling the market to go up? Is it certain types of stocks that are in favor? certain types of stocks that are not in favor, <clears throat> right? How do we go about gauging that? And so you want to make sure that in this market you're very, I would call it intentional. You're very intentional on where your allocations are located. What's driving the performance of this? And if you take a look right now, what's driving the performance has been dubbed the Magnificent Seven. It's a handful of tech stocks, okay, that's, that's going in there. So it's a crowded space. They're averaging about 33 on a P.E. ratio, which is very high. But yet at the same time, you go back and you look at history and you say, well, wait a second here. Good performing stocks in sectors that are hot can command a demand premium on a P.E. ratio, right? 
So how do you know when it gets too lofty? How do you know and all that stuff? And what does it look like going forward? These are the questions that you have to sit down and really analyze for when yourself. When to tap the brakes, right? When to put the brakes on. Yeah. When to, when, but my point is, congratulations to those of you that stayed and played. You're <laughs> at an all-time high again. You know, and I've got the latest data here. It hasn't come out in 2024 20, yet for the year ending 23. They're still crunching those numbers. But from January tw of 2003 through December of 2022, if you missed the, the if you stayed fully invested <clears throat> during that period of time, during those 20 years right there, you would have had, in, invested in the S&P, you would have had a 9.8% return just in that 20 year period of time. If you missed the best 10 days during that 20 year period of time, your return would have been 5.6%. If you missed the best 20 days, your return would have been 2.9%. And it just goes down from there. The key here is staying invested. Stay in. Now, sometimes you get a little defensive, but you stay in. Sometimes you get a little bit more defensive, but you're still in the game, okay? The key is you, to cut off the panic finger, finger the one that says sell. Right? That's exactly right, Chris. My, my, and, and so they're crunching the numbers now for year-end 2023. It's still a little too early to get those numbers out, but it's going to be interesting. History shows the market's done 10.13, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, that last 20 years there is 9.8. It's not far off the mark from that standpoint. And, and uh, you know, you, you've got to make sure that as you approach in time the point when you need to start pulling money back to receive income, that's how you position yourself more conservatively. And there's four or five strategies to do that with, okay? So you've got to sit down and get educated on all of that to reduce risk, to turn it into efficient streams of income from tax-wise perspective, you know, and just kind of go from there. So going to be very interesting here. Early in the year, we still are on the Fed pause button, not the Fed. Uh, uh, re, um, Accelerator? Uh, yeah, we're not. Yeah, exactly. But the Fed has moved from the position of being against us to being with us now. They've gone from foe to friend from, from that with standpoint. Me or against me. Yep. Yeah, there you go. So, so we've, got, we've got some unanswered questions right here. Uh, very exciting time. We do expect to see, we, we are seeing a broadening of, of participation among stocks because the s and is hitting a higher high. That was my point earlier with 500 stocks versus just the Dow or the tech-heavy tech uh, NASDAQ stocks there. So, hey, I got a quick announcement here. Check this out. Go visit my website, RosenthalWealthManagement.com or LarryRosenthal.com. We have published our, our seminar series, our webinar series for 2024. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've got nine different months that we're doing webinars on, and it's all on the website right now. And we've got the first registration open. It's going to take place on February 8th. So here's the deal. So go to the website, LarryRosenthal.com. Click on the little seminar tab. You'll see the whole menu of all of our of all of our subjects that we're doing March seventh, April fourth, May 9th, all these different places, okay, that we're that we're doing and all the different subject matter. Uh, but on February eighth, we're kicking off twenty twenty four with an outlook for twenty twenty four and the registration. We just opened it this week. So go check it out, LarryRosenthal.com, click on the seminar button. We're going to have people from all over the country there, and we're going to give you our outlook for 2024. We're going to talk about some of the tough questions and tough things, so go check it out there if you'd like. You can also, those of you that are watching on LarryRosenthal.tv on YouTube, you can hit the UR code, and it'll take you right there to the to the. Um, uh, web page to, to register. There's no cost for this webinar. We want to continue to provide you with proper financial planning and education material. So go check it out, LarryRosenthal.com. Click on the seminar icon and go ahead and register for the upcoming February 8th Market Outlook uh, webinar that we'll be doing. So we're going to take a quick break here. Give us a call. It is Open Mic Saturday. It is, and which I love because we get all kinds of questions. Whatever's on your mind today, estate planning, taxes, mortgages, what to do with your home, dollar cost averaging, your 401k, insurance, wills, trust, whatever's on your mind, give us a call this morning at 855-ROSE-123, 855-ROSE-123. That's 855 855 
767-3123. You listen to Making Money Sense. I'm Larry Rosenthal. We'll be back in a moment. You are listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. There are still too many countries that give little or no assistance to disabled children. In third world nations, these children could be left alone while parents try to eke out a living. About 10 years ago, residents of Prince William and Fauquier counties in Virginia formed Children with Disabilities Fund International. It focuses on the needs of disabled children. CDFI's current work in Jamaica and Kenya supports about 300 disabled children and their families. For some of these children, they're getting the care they need for the first time in their lives. CDFI recently began an individual child sponsorship program in an effort to better meet the needs of these disabled children. To choose your child to sponsor, go to thecdfi.org. That's thecdfi.org. Your gift will help transform not only a disabled child's life, but the lives of their parents and of the surrounding community. Go to thecdfi.org. Make a difference. Go to the cdfi.org. You've seen and heard him on Fox Business, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Well, we're back with The Larry Rosenthal Show, 855-767-3123, 855-ROSE-123. And here in just a minute, we'll have that QR code up on YouTube, but we do have that live webinar coming up that you want to talk to us about a little bit, Larry. We do. It's going to be our 2024 outlook. Uh, We like to do that always after January each year, you know, get some economic data rolling in and then we'll give a good look outlook on 2024 just to see what it looks like. Okay. Uh, Okay. You know, and then it's a wild ride from there. Right. See who who gets right and wrong and all their guesses and things. Uh, But it's a lot of fun. So we're going to basically it'll boil down to taking a look at some of the more salient points in the economy that you want to follow. And that's what I want to teach people. Mm -hmm. And then they can read the tea leaves from it for themselves. I'll give my little estimates here and there. But, you know, I want everybody everybody to learn how to do that. You know, I want people to learn how to how to read the economy and, and, cool. and see what's happening, you know, and, and stuff like that. You know, hey, you know, I, I, I texted a, uh, I was texting with a friend earlier this week and talking about some stuff. And and uh, it, it kind of this this applies in all different ways. It applies to money. It applies to, to, to everything. And and um, uh, where did it go here? What have we lost? I've lost my little note. Um, oh, here it is. It's in uh, Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him, right? Who take refuge in him, who seek the shelter of the Lord. And in, unfortunately, a lot of people put all that trust and faith in money, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we need to, again, be good stewards with it and understand our role as a manager a steward of what the Lord has given us all, right? And how are we using that to further his gospel message, right? So let's take refuge in the Lord. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. But money might not be the same case. Matter of fact, it's not. So let's get our priorities right as we continue to move into 2024 with all of this. Uh, A couple of announcements here real quick. Uh, kind of some interesting numbers. I went back to see this, and uh, uh, just the other day, President Biden signed signed some more relief for college debt, 
And uh, since oh. January of 2022, the Biden administration has discharged $136 billion of student oh. loans, 3.7 borrowers. And this program's been in place now um, for since uh, 2007. George Bush put it in place. He signed it into law. And it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a hot topic. It's a political hot topic, you know. Whose loans get get um, um, uh, forgiven who, who and who gets it, who doesn't, right? And whose doesn't? That's exactly right. But but you can go check it out. Just Google it up there. It's all over the internet. For the longest it, it, time before, it was just those that worked for uh, nonprofit organizations that got it relieved. But now there, well, that's what this program was the other day. Okay, uh, it was okay. the nonprofits and the students and, and oh, I'm sorry, teachers and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so look into that a little bit. But, you know, these people have have, you know, gone into those vocations knowing this was part of the program that was established, you know, in 2007. So mm -hmm. just did a little bit of research on there just uh, to, to take a look at it. But what does that do that does propel spending that does help grow the economy because there's less debt there? And there is a, you know, here's part of the controversy here, and, and I don't certainly mean to do that, but, but uh, it's not as if the taxpayers are paying for this. And this ought to light up the phones a little bit. <laughs> but but you if, you think, if, if you think about it, you know, they just forgave it. They, they printed money and then forgave it. So, mm -hmm. so there's not an increase in taxes on this to anybody. Um, is it still fair, though, the program? That's the question, that right? The question. That is the question that has to be answered uh, al along those lines. So, hey, just putting that out there, it's open mic Saturday. Any questions at all, you know, any subject matter. So, so uh, I thought I'd throw that out there today just a little bit because it hit some headlines yesterday. And I thought, you know, that's Can we put my Kelmar kind of a... jacket on here for a minute? Yep. Wait for the incoming calls. There you go. Okay. There you go. So uh, we do get a lot of questions, speaking of questions, from, from uh, listeners all, all over. And, and uh, you know, they call the office. They're asking for things we talk about. And, and, you know, if you hear subject matter that we talk about on the show, be happy to send it out to you. Just give the office a call uh, or, you know, shoot us off an email. Go to my website, LarryRosenthal.com, shoot us off an email. Got some questions from the email bag here today. One question is, is there a way around taxes on my 401k? Can, what else is it? Can I reduce the taxes on my 401k when I turn it into income? And, and the answer is, well, yes, you kind of can. You can convert some of that money into a Roth IRA, but you still have to pay taxes on that conversion. If you go the conversion route, then when you make that conversion, you have to wait five years for that money, for the earnings of that money to be seasoned, for that to come out tax-free. And then the other way around that is to get a corresponding tax deduction on your tax return. Maybe you do some increased charitable giving or, make so, or, or do something so you can look at your tax return and see how you can use that as a benefit to reduce the income taxes that you receive from your 401k plan. You know, but also remember this, when you put money into your 401k plan pre-tax, you got a tax deduction that year for putting it in. That's part of the game. The problem that we have is, is you know, the, the, the retirement plans were kind of told to us, taught to us, you know, hey, you're going to retire in a lower tax bracket. And for many people, that's not necessarily the case because tax brackets have changed over the years. But at the same time, now you've got to take a look at Social Security tax. You've got to take a look at your Medicare premiums under IRMA, the uh, ACA Obamacare tax, uh, health care, 3.8. There's a handful of taxes that get put on top, plus you get an increased standard deduction if you're over 65. So there's kind of a tax equation to a lot of this stuff. And when you're sitting down with your advisor looking at the components of taxation during your retirement years, how much money have you saved that's never been taxed? How can you reduce a good amount of those taxes coming in? And, and those, those are a couple of ways around it. And sometimes I see, you know, remember this, if Congress doesn't do anything in January of 2026, which is not far away, okay, um, taxes go back up. 
to the pre to pre Trump tax breaks. Uh, so so there's going to be even more tax issues coming upon us when money's coming out of these retirement plans. So that's kind of the answer. Sit down, take a look at your tax projections, and then work with your advisor to see how you can minimize what types of strategies can be implemented to minimize. It can be done. We have these conversations all the time with people in the office. Uh, another question that I received this past week. Uh, oh, you got a yeah, do you want to talk to Bernard on the phone there? I do. I don't have the screener up. Uh, here we go. Let me grab it here real quick, Chris. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's go ahead and bring Bernard on. Good morning, Bernard. How are you today? Good morning, Bernard. How are you today? Okay, um, sir, good morning and happy new year. Better now that I hear your voice. Thank you for taking my call. <laughs> sure. How are you? Happy sir, new year, how sir. How are you? Happy uh, Yes, sir. So um, I have a question in two, two different topics. One, in regards to an employer-sponsored 401, um, 401 Roth 401k, and a 403B, how should I divvy up the contributions? 50-50, 60-40? Well, are you talking about on the pre-tax side or the, or the post-tax side divvying it up or between the two plans? If it's between the two plans, then you're aggregately allowed to max out to the federal guideline limits. You can't max out one plan and max out the other plan for your contributions, okay? So that very quickly then dictates to which one has a better investment lineup. Then you take a look at do you want it to be pre-tax or post-tax on the Roth side, okay? So that would be the way that you'd look at it. What are the investment choices in the 403B? What are the investment choices in the 401k plan? They both should have a Roth angle to them as well. Yes, the 403b um, is a pre-tax, and the Roth 401k is a post-tax. Okay, so maybe they just added a 401k and put it pre post-tax to you then and didn't change the 403b. That's fine, too. So now it boils down to this. Ask yourself this question, Bernard. How much money have you saved in, in, you know, in all your different savings vehicles? How much of that money has never been taxed before? In other words, do you currently have the majority of your savings in a pre-tax position? That means when you're in retirement years, you're going to have most of your money coming out, and you're going to have to pay taxes on it. On the other hand, and now let me talk out of the other side of my mouth here for you, <laughs> and then I'll give you the answer, okay? On the other hand, do you have to pay taxes in April, or do you get a tax refund? If you have to pay taxes in April, then, one, you can increase your deduction or, or your, your, your withholding, but, two, you may want to look at the pre-tax side of things. Uh, Versus if you get a refund, then you can afford, obviously, to put money into the Roth side because the Roth money goes after tax. But I'm, I'm in the camp of both, personally, okay? And here's the deal. If you, if you look down the road and you say, you know what, the most of my money's never been taxed before, okay, you're going to be in the camp in retirement years about complaining about taxes versus saying, you know what, if, if I put it on the Roth side right now, you'll be enjoying it tax-free down the road in retirement years, and it's a whole different scenario from that standpoint because taxes do go up. There, there's no doubt about that. They go up and down um, o over time. So if I brought 100 financial advisors in from around the country right now, the first third would tell you to put it all pre-tax because you get your tax deduction today, the next third are going to say, no, Bernard, put it all post-tax on the Roth because you're going to get it all tax-free coming out in retirement years. I'm in the middle. I like money on both sides. I recognize I like you getting a tax deduction today, but I also like you putting money on the Roth side so you get tax-free income down the road in retirement years. So that takes me all the way back to my first point, which is how much money do you have in your accounts that's never been taxed before? If you're saying, oh, I got 90% of all my money has never been taxed, maybe we should start putting some on the Roth side. Remember this, too, that for, the, for 24 and for 25, taxes are lower. 
In 26, taxes go up. So now's an opportunity to fund Roth in 2024 and 2025 in a lower tax bracket because there's a good chance in 2026, unless Congress holds up uh, the current, current rates, you're going to be paying a higher tax. Then you might want to shift over to pre-tax there. So it's really one-on-one -on -one from that standpoint. But I'm in the camp of, of leaning more towards Roth, but I like both sides. Okay? Okay. Uh, and, this, and, this and, and yeah, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to send you out our toolkit because that's going to help align the, the math equations for you on this, okay? And we'll show you how to do, how to do that. And, and maybe it ends up being you do 70% Roth for a few years and then 50% Roth for a few years. It, a lot of it's going to depend on the tax code, too, and your year-by-year -year tax returns as well. Remember, you can change it back and forth, okay? This is a, a, a tax plan that we're implementing today, ultimately, to get the best bang for your buck in retirement years. That's what this is about. So it's a year-by-year -year decision a lot of times. So if you like, Bernard, I'll put you on hold, and I'm going to send you out our financial planning toolkit. We'll have somebody reach out to you on the Roth question for you, okay? Yeah, one more question, please. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. So, uh, money market certificate. I have about 50K that I'd like to save uh, up for uh, my daughter. So, um, should I go for a short 18 months, which pays the biggest? Or, since we're looking at interest rates maybe going down, maybe go for a two year, which pays 1.3% less? What's the rate on the two year? Um, the rate on the two year is 3.8. The rate on the uh, 18 uh, months is uh, 4.8. So I like the 18 month, okay, um, from what you're saying. You can also look at a treasury bill. I know the other day a one year T bill was at 4.8, okay. The advantage there is you don't pay state tax. In a bank CD, you pay state and federal tax. So you save a little bit of tax money there. Uh, but if rates go down, now's the time to lock it in. So getting 4.8 in an 18-month versus a two-year at, at what did you say, 1.3? 3.67, uh, no, I believe. No, I like the other one better. I like the 18-month. Okay. That's, Even, that's my opinion on it. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank you, Definitely. sir. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I'll place you on a quick hold here, Bernard. Appreciate the phone call. Have a great weekend. Hey, you're listening to Making Money Sense. Dial us up. 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. Any questions at all on this open mic Saturday here? We'll take a quick break. We'll be back in a moment with more Making Money Sense. <laughs> Listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855 Rose 123. That's 855 767 3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. And here's another Money Minute with Larry Rosenthal. So many different ways to invest money lump sum deposits, buy and hold, market timing. How about dollar cost averaging? Put the same amount of money into the same investment at every interval, whether it's monthly, quarterly, annually, whatever it may be. This gives you the greatest opportunity to get the average price over the long term of the investment because one of the secrets to creating wealth is the acquisition of shares. You want to keep buying more and more shares over time. On the flip side, when you're in your retirement years and you want to distribute dollars to yourself for income, do the same thing in reverse. Dollar cost average out during your retirement years. with your financial plan today at LarryRosenthal.com or call right now for the Financial Planning Toolkit, 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Welcome back to The Larry Rosenthal Show, 855-767-3123 is the number to call. 
That's 855-ROSE-123 to talk to Larry Rosenthal, who is live here in studio. And if you're on YouTube, we've got a nice little uh, icon there at the top left-hand corner of your screen that says, hey, register for that upcoming webinar. Larry? Yes, Chris? Register for that upcoming webinar. I'll be there. <laughs> you better be. <laughs> be kind of hard to have one without you. <laughs> I'll be there, sir. Definitely, definitely. Outstanding. Hey, you know, so let's take a look at why retirees work. Why they work. Well, I know yep. one of I know one reason. Can I give you one reason? Sure. <clears throat> it's because they get bored. They get bored. Ah, let's see here. <laughs> is that one of the is that one of your, your list? That's a ninety percent of the reason. Yeah. Is it? So Ember wow. Ember Ember just came out with a new survey. Um, uh, with multiple responses allowed, and this is at the end of 2023, uh, Employee Benefit Research Institute. They have just some great questions that they put out there in, in my industry. And it was when asked why people continue to work uh, uh, for pay, retirees cited lots of positive reasons. 90% was to stay active and involved, right? Uh, 81% was they just said, we enjoy working. Now, whether or not they're working in their same career or maybe a different industry or different job or less stress or something like that doesn't mm -hmm. go into saying that. But personally, I see a lot of people doing that. They say, you know, Larry, how do I get out of this stress-packed job and into something that I can enjoy, spend more time with the kids, grandkids, you know, hiking, golfing, whatever they do. Um, uh, without as much stress as, as possible. You know, 81% said they enjoy working. 71% said they just want extra money to buy extra things. 59% said they don't want to reduce their savings. Oh, there's an idea. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so retirement has changed, you know, and, and we know this. It's changed. You know, it used to be our parents or grandparents' generation would retire They'd be on the front porch, and if they went back to work, it was, you know, shameful, right? Now, mm -hmm. but, but they had a very short life expectancy. Now people are living in their late 70s, 80s, 90s, which is a good thing, good problem to have, right? People want to stay young, involved, active. Right. Well, that used to be uh, the day also when they had the golden handcuffs, right? They had the pension so they could kind of. That's right. Kind of they don't have that. A lot of people don't have that anymore. 51% yeah. uh, said coming out of retirement because another job opportunity arose mm -hmm. that they that was intriguing to them. And they said, you know what? I'm going to get back in the game. Let's go. Okay. Uh, here's kind of a yeah, lukewarm. 42% said because they need the money. So that's below 50%, which, which is, is good. good. Yeah. That means that, that, that the industry is doing good work in helping people save for retirement, right? Um, but at the same time, 42% are saying we needed the money. So how do we go back in time and, and reduce that number down? Mm -hmm. And that's understanding. That's, that's taking a look at where you are. You know, you're in your 20s, and you're, like, worried about Friday night. You know, what, what am I going to do Friday and Saturday night? Uh, very few people in their 20s are, are actively saving money. People get into their 30s, and now we're getting into the family formation stages where, you know, you're, you're getting married, you you start having children, a dog, you maybe you get a mortgage, things like that. You have kids, you now you need the minivan, you get a bigger home, and money's strapped, and you're in that family formation years. And then all of a sudden, you turn into your low 40s, and you're sitting there thinking, I've got college funding, and then a couple years after that, I've got retirement planning. Now what? And that's usually the catalyst that people start saving at that age in life. It's a whole different scenario, though, when I see somebody at that age who has been saving all along the way. It's substantially different. Yeah. Okay. It's a little more comforting, right? It's a little easier to deal there with. There is a little bit more of a cushion when you sit down. That's for sure, Chris. Yeah. And, and, and my point is start saving uh, you know, soon. Uh, start understanding the value of compound interest, appreciating shares, acquisition of shares, and things like that. But it was an interesting survey reading sure. through it, you know, taking a look at it. A 13% said because they want to keep their health insurance benefits. 
Okay. Oh, wow. That's an idea. That's a thought. I know that's why sometimes people have their wives still working. It's just for the insurance that they can get. I've seen husbands working. I've seen wives yeah, working yeah, just absolutely. for the insurance. It doesn't, doesn't that, matter. That's yeah. exactly right. Yep. With, uh, with, quick question there on the screen uh, from one of our uh, YouTube uh, watchers. Yep. Good morning and thank you for the show on retirement savings. Can you clarify if TSP contributions count towards the annual limit of retirement savings? Yes, they do. The TSP is the government savings plan is the equivalent to the private sector's 401k or 403b it's the thrift savings plan for government and and so so you have the same aggregate limits of how much money you can put in in that plan okay and follow up to that also what is the maximum income to qualify for roth ira contributions for 23 and 24 uh are you single <laughs> right or are you married filing jointly yeah Pull that one out of the file right off the top of your head there, Larry. I don't know if they're single or married filing jointly, but I don't have the tax rates in front of me, but I would say married filing jointly for Roth exclusion, I believe, is 184 or somewhere in that ballpark right there. There you go. Um, so uh, I can, uh, if you want, I can email it to them after the show. Uh, it's on my computer, and uh, I don't have it right here in front of me. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's funny, Chris. The answer is I read the entire Internet last night except for that question. <laughs> Come on. So yeah, how does that sound? Right? GPG, where but I believe it's Mary it? filing jointly right around 180, 185, 184, somewhere in that, in, in, in that ballpark. All right. Claudia's so. got a question on the screen there for you. So what is your recommendation with extra cash that is not needed for 10 years? Dollar cost invest in the uh, equities or stocks or both or invest all at once? Well, Claudia, that's that's uh, I would say with where the markets are right now, I like the dollar cost averaging aspect because between now and over the next 10 years, the markets will pull back, will have some pullbacks in the market. And that's when you can reach in with a larger lump sum and and acquire more shares when it goes down. OK, but, you know, the 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 risk of putting it all in today is that. The, we put it in now and the market goes goes back down and it stays down for 18 months. You just got to play that waiting game. So I like the idea of dollar cost averaging here. Um, and you can you can since you're saying you don't want that money for 10 years, dollar cost averaging it now, I would put it into your investment account, okay? Maybe in a T bill or uh, some sort of investment, that's giving you interest. So put it into the investment account in a T-bill maybe, and then periodically move the money out of the T-bill right into the equities. And then on days when the equities are down, grab a bunch of it and put it in. That's the way that I would do it. That way you're getting paid while you're waiting because the money's sitting in T-bills. So it's sitting there getting paid for you. Interest, okay? You can put it in a one-month T-bill at just under five right now. And then you just pull it off on days that the markets are down and buy those shares uh, less expensive. That's the way that I would go about doing it. Cool. And uh, on Ward, mm -hmm. followed up with this. Too funny. Thank you. I'm single, by the way. So. Oh, well, then cut those numbers in half here. Okay. <laughs> okay. At, the, at the break, I can look it up for you real quick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. uh, but there you go. So, so um, uh uh, any other questions here? Well, hey, give us a it. call. Yeah, also, hey, in, check it out. We love the, the, the YouTube questions at LarryRosenthal.tv. Uh, you can watch us live stream the show in our different locations now uh, across the country. Or you can give us a call live at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. You know, I just thought of something, Larry. We could actually do weather reports from almost all over the country if we really wanted to. Well, we Coast, can. West we do Coast have the, and... the country dotted here between <laughs> uh, the northwest, the southeast, and uh, mid-Atlantic. Yeah, it's kind of awesome. You know, my scenario looks like snow, which is fine for me. Snow so, here, anyway, too. Except yeah, for Florida, so. where Bob's at, not snow. <laughs> Maybe we should send some down there, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah. Right, right, right. Hey, don't don't forget to check out my website, LarryRosenthal.tv. Uh, I'm sorry, LarryRosenthal.com, and sign up for our upcoming uh, webinar. It's going to be February 8th, okay, and it's going to be on uh, our outlook of 2024. But more importantly, I'm going to teach you some of the more uh, pertinent points that we let we look at to really sort of gauge what it, how to form that outlook uh, opinion. So there's no cost for the webinar. Uh, it's free. There's going to be two times. 
noon to 1 and then 6 to 7 p.m. So noon to 1 Eastern and then 6 to 7 p.m. You could take both classes if you want. It's fine. But when you're there, check it out. We've got nine different months and the titles of each one of our webinars up there. So we want to, you know, sort of give you a little bit of a syllabus there and, and show you how uh, all the material that we're going to be uh, bringing to you this year in our webinar series. We are also going to be having uh, some in-person uh, seminars again this year as well. And if you'd like me to come out to your organization, to your church, to your office, whatever it is, and formulate an educational financial educational class for for your your group your employees your associates whatever feel free to reach us reach out to us we've done tons of these over the years we customize it to your group and you know happy to to do that we want to continue to provide financial planning education with a proper perspective on everything for you there so hey we're going to take a quick break we'll keep the phone lines open give us a call at 855 rose 123 that's 855 767 3123 back in a moment with more making money sense You are listening to Making Money Sense live with Larry Rosenthal. Phone lines are open for your retirement and financial planning questions at 855-ROSE-123. That's 855-767-3123. More Making Money Sense in a moment. And here's another Money Minute with Larry Rosenthal. We've heard oftentimes about asset allocation. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. We need to understand tax allocation. The IRS views our money through four different tax lenses. Taxable, tax deductible and deferred, non-deductible and deferred, tax exempt, or tax free. Stop for a moment and think, how much money have you saved up in your retirement plans, place the money's never been taxed? Here's the rule on that. You control 100% but you only own 65% of it. We need to make sure that our income in retirement years is tax efficient to maintain your standard of living. on Fox Business, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. Larry Rosenthal is here right now to take your calls at 855-767-3123. That's 855-ROSE-123. This is The Larry Rosenthal Show. Welcome back to The Larry Rosenthal Show, 855-767-3123, 855-ROSE-123. Coming out of the break here, Larry Lacey wants to know, Hi, where would I start to get one of those T-bills, please? Uh, at the government. You can do it a couple of different ways. You can go to uh, treasury.gov uh, and buy them directly there. There's a couple of disadvantages doing that versus putting it into a brokerage account. Um, or you can just open up a brokerage account and buy it right there. Uh, so, so we like doing it through the brokerage account because you can move the T-bills uh, to get a better rate from time to time versus going directly to the government there. But those are the two ways that you go about doing it. You know, and one of the advantages there is that <clears throat> the T-bills, for those of you that live in states that have state income taxes, you don't pay state income taxes on T-bill interest, whereas at the bank CDs you do. You pay state and federal taxes on bank CDs. The T-bills you just pay federal taxes. The state tax is exempt. So it saves you a little bit of money there by, by, by doing that. And the T-bills are guaranteed, and you can buy a one-month, three-month, six-month, five, uh, uh, one-year. Uh, and Then you can get into some bonds, two years, and on all, all the way out to, to 30 years. I wonder how a day would perform if I just went in with the day bill. Baked, they, that would probably not. Never mind. A day bill? <laughs> you know, buy it for one day? Yeah. Not going to make S me much Send money. it to Bob, and he'll send it back to you. <laughs> okay. With 2% interest. Thank you, Bob. There you go. There you go. Thanks for those there questions, by the yep. way. Lacey, we appreciate that question. Keep yep. them coming. Yep. We we uh, have getting a lot of uh, subscribers on our YouTube channel, LarryRosenthal.tv. You can, you can again, watch the, the how the show streamed live and, and ask questions there, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lot of fun, too. So, you know, we, we uh, often get um, – I, I was meeting with somebody the other day, 
um, new, new, new client. They were in the office and we were talking about, you know, their investment lineups, our investment lineups, things like that. And how do you determine where you want to be? How do you look at a particular investment? How do you decide, yes, this is a go, no, it's not, you know? Well, after you decide what your objectives are, after you decide what your uh, asset selection is going to be, where you want the money to be, do you want it to be in finances or emerging markets or international or, or, you know, materials or tech or whatever it may be, you know, after you decide all of that stuff and you decide, do I want an ETF, individual stocks, do I want a mutual fund, after you decide all that stuff too, right? So you're going down layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Now you're sitting there and you're going, okay, this is what we want. Let's say it's an ETF or a mutual fund, whatever, or an individual stock. You decide, no, I don't want an individual stock in this case. I want a mutual fund or an ETF. Now what do you look at? You know, now how do you decide between an ETF and a mutual fund? And then all of a sudden, boom, you decide, hey, I want a mutual fund. Now we've decided these, these five or six different screening things of asset class, tax efficiency, this, that, place, and all that kind of stuff, sectors and stuff. Now what do you decide, right? So you, you want to take a look at a handful of things in order to grade the mutual fund. One is how does that fund actually rank amongst its peer group? in the same category. Where is its ranking? Not only over the last 12 months, last three months, but the last three years, five years, 10 years. How long has that management person or team been at the helm of that fund to get those rankings? What about the upside and downside capture of a portfolio? And this is what I was explaining to somebody the other day. You know, think about a roller coaster. That roller coaster goes up the hill and it comes down the other side, right? Well, when, when the markets are going up and you're the lead car on that roller coaster, it's a fun ride. You're waving, you're happy, you're walking around going, man, I'm a great stock picker and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden it starts to come down and you're that first car heading down that hill and you're going, whoa, you know, maybe I didn't sign up for this ride right. Hands you up know? in the air, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but a lot of times when it stocks, you're gripping the, gripping the handlebars, on, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so what is the upside and downside capture? In other words, like if the upside capture formula comes out to, let's say, 95 or let's say 105, how's that? Mm. Let's say it comes out to 105. That means if the market goes up 10%, you're going to go up 10.5%. What about the downside capture? Maybe you have an upside capture of 105 and a downside capture of, say, 92. That means when the market drops 10%, you're only going to drop 9.2. Is it possible to build a portfolio where you can get close to the upside of the market and on the downside, cut it down by 15 or 20%? Yes, you can. Mm. And that's what I was explaining. That's when you go through these layers of looking at how to build the portfolio and ultimately decide this stock, this fund, this ETF, this bond allocation. That's how you build this thing. And that's what I was explaining is, is, you know, how do you go about really screening for all of this stuff and really taking a solid look at it all? And it's, and, and it's, and it's full time, you know? And they were asking, you know, well, how often do you, do you look at it? And I said, here's my screen. We, we watch it all day. This is what we do, you know? Green, red, yellow, the whole nine yards, right? <laughs> so, so no, but, but uh, uh, it's important to understand why you own things and what you own and how the economy directly affects all of that. And the number one unanswered question that people at, don't ask, the, the num I think the number one question people don't ask when making an investment decision is, what has to take place for it not to work? Right? What has to take place for the investment decision not to work? And that's how you go about protecting downside risk is it the fed is it rates is it taxes is it is it cyclicality is it all kinds of of different things right 
that's really what you have to take a look at. So, hey, enjoyed the show today, everybody. Appreciate the phone calls and the write-in questions at LarryRosenthal.tv. We'll be back next Saturday with another session of Making Money Sense. Until then, visit our website, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on LarryRosenthal.tv on YouTube. You get the announcements each week on our show. And uh, don't forget to register for our upcoming webinar on um, February 8th, Thursday, February 8th. It's going to be our 2024 Outlook. Go to the website, LarryRosenthal.com, click on the Seminar button, and you can register right there. So for Bob in the back and Chris McKay, I'm Larry Rosenthal. Have a wonderful week. We'll be back next Saturday with another session of Making Money Sense.